If you have your copy of God's Word, and I pray that you do, take it out and we'll turn over to uh, John chapter 2, the last uh, three verses of it, and we will read to John chapter 3, verse 13. When you find your place, please stand with me to read into God's Word in reverence to this God. In verse 23, it says, Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven, but he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for being so gracious to us. And Lord, we pray as we look into your words this morning, that you would help us to understand the weightiness of what we're digging into in verse 3. Lord, we ask that you would bring that weight by making your presence known, that we may understand how important it is to know this very starting point of all things spiritual. So, Father, we pray for your presence. We pray, Lord, that you bring the hammer to shatter the stony heart to make live again. That our hearts right now, as lovers of Jesus Christ, are burning with desire to worship you, Lord, as you have given the word before us today. But help us, Lord, to be willing to hear from you and none other. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated, thank you. Today we are picking up at verse 3. Last week we looked at the dead qualifications, meaning the credentials that uh, Nicodemus brought to the table, which disqualified him for the qualification that's needed to enter into the kingdom of God. And this is the heaviest thing that you will imagine or can put your mind around today is these very words. There's nothing more important, nothing more pressing 
than these words that we will be looking at today. Last week, we looked at the dead uh, works of uh, Nicodemus, bringing that he was qualified to come into the kingdom of God, thinking that he had the kingdom of God, thinking he was in the kingdom of God. He got the shock of his life when he was told, Nicodemus, in all your works, in all your ability, do not meet the qualification. It all starts right here, folks. And I want you to feel, know my heart on this, is that we can't afford to be wrong about this. May God bless us by making our hearts heavy. May God bless us by saying and making, having us understand there's nothing more important than what we're talking about right now today. If you were the president of the United States, even being sworn in, that is nothing compared to what we're talking about today. This is the most important words that you will ever hear in your entire life. It is the requirement of qualification to enter into, to see, to enter into the kingdom of God. And you will leave here one way or the other, receiving this truth and shattering all your false hopes that you have a one-time belief in Christ and rejoicing because God spoke to you today by exposing you and who he is, who you are, and your inability, as we have in the text, to be able to do anything to qualify us for the kingdom of God. Nobody wants what they deserve. And by God's grace, we will be looking at the dead qualifications, which we looked at last week. I'm just going to touch on a couple of things here. It says in the text itself today that we are dead in sin. Now, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time here because we get this. But there's people that don't get this. They may have ears to hear, but they're not sinking it in. Because if we are really dead in sin, we, the only person that we have hope in is to God to give us life that we may not be dead in sin any longer. And this is the power of God when he invades. It doesn't ask, but he just invades our soul with his truth and who he is. There's nothing more important. I pray that you're clearing your mind out now. Don't be thinking about anything, not even the floods. Not even the trauma that has uh, taken place because it all starts right here. It really does. Nicodemus got the shock of his life when he understand that he was dead in sin. Now he's working on that part with Nicodemus. He is speaking to that between the lines and but we have to come to the throne of grace knowing that our, de our, our sins, we were born dead spiritually. There's not a person on this earth that does not have to be born of God. Every person that ever lived on the face of the earth has to be born from above in order to understand what the kingdom of God is, even to also enter the kingdom of God. When we look at this, we tend to see to say it's not that bad. When we use the word dead, again, I'm not going to stay long here. When we use the word dead, we never say something's dead unless we really think it's completely dead. We would apply it's almost dead or it's barely alive. The scripture says when it's dead, it's dead. And what does it mean? You're dead. So this strips us of all of our ability that we may think that we qualify ourselves to enter into the kingdom of God. Nicodemus was trusting in his education. Nicodemus was trusting in his bloodline, being born in the right family. 
right? Nicodemus was trusting in many things. Nicodemus is anywhere from 50 to 70 years old, and he got told by God himself, you got it all wrong. The question is, would we be able to hear that today? Because maybe you do have it all wrong. And if you don't praise God, you'll give him all the glory because it wasn't you that birthed you into his family. It was him. So we are saved by, by grace alone, through faith alone, through scripture alone, through Christ alone, for the glory of God alone. And when we say that, we mean it. We can wave the flag all that we want to, right? But we now work out of a different sphere as we think about the new nature that is needed to be to enter into the kingdom of God. And I'll close this part here with one these words right here from Corinthians. And it means what it says. Do y'all believe scripture? Yes and amen. Well, it says this in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, 14. A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. And he cannot understand them, for they are spiritually appraised, meaning considered, valued, looked at, where you can't do that because you're not spiritually alive. And that settles it. And we know that there's many other scriptures that, that point to that. And, but do we believe it? And we have to understand that there's more in the Bible than John 3, 16. Us having John 3, 16 is not going to make us right with God. It starts right here. It boils down to this part here when Nicodemus came by night. There's many different things that you can say there about that particular part. But today, we're going to continue into that part where Nicodemus came by night. There's two things that we'll see, a, a thread that goes through the gospel, truth and a lie, light and darkness. All these things come here, but this interview that we're entering, going into as uh, Nicodemus came to interview Christ. Christ turns the interview around and interviews Nicodemus. Isn't that good? Because we have to look in that mirror. We need to be able to see what is taking place. We need to be able to understand what's taking place. And we can't do that unless God invades and takes over and runs us over by the power of the Holy Spirit and changes us forevermore. The required qualification for to enter, to see the kingdom of God is that you must be born again. Now, this is so important. If you're not born again today, if you're not a lover of Jesus Christ, right, this is so important. It's just you should spend the rest of your life chasing it down until you understand. This is how important it is. I'll do that tomorrow now. Speaking volumes. When we hear this, verse 3, as we see in verse 3, uh, verse uh, 2, this man came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher. No one could do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus takes control of the conversation. Aren't you glad of that? We see here that He's entering into this interview with God himself. Looking into the incarnate one, into his eyes, having a conversation with him, right? Beholding God in his glory. Now, Nicodemus is dead in the sin. He doesn't get this. But he, Jesus Christ, and this should excite us, Jesus Christ is God who came to teach us who we are, and what needs to be done to us. The prayer that we should have as we go through this is that, Lord, invade my privacy. Invade my soul. Lord, do what is necessary that I may understand it's not me repeating the prayer, or being baptized, or joining the church, or me doing it on my own. 
It's by the power of the Almighty God that cleanses us from within, and we'll get into that. But Jesus goes on a whole different realm. And he talks to Jesus, truly, truly. I mean, he talks to Nicodemus, truly, truly. Now, when you see that, emphasis is added. And it's good because Jesus gives the amen at the beginning of the sermon. It says, truly, truly, surely, surely, amen and amen. What I'm about to say is the most important word that you'll hear in your entire life is what Jesus is saying to us. To that dead corpse laying there, this is what is the most important thing in our entire life. Why? Because when we die, it's not the end. We have to have this Christ. We have to have him. Truly, truly, listen. As we look at this required qualification, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Do you realize how important this is? Do you realize this is the key to everything? This is the very key to the kingdom of God? And the evidence is all the fruit that comes with it. But right here is the key. This is the key. This is where it all starts at. This is the beginning of your life with Christ. This is the most important words. I hope you don't get tired of that because I can't emphasize it enough to how important this is. No job interview that you ever had is this important. Nothing that you ever have done is this important. Nothing that you can ever attend is important as this. He says, Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you just can't understand. And that doesn't mean Nicodemus wasn't smart. We know his background, very educated man. He was the teacher of Israel, and he didn't, he didn't get this. Why? Because it takes the act of God to raise a dead man up. That's grace. That's grace. That's what grace is. God doing a work in, in us. Now, while I speak a little bit more right here, I want you to turn over to Ezekiel 36. And I want you to lay these, your eyes upon this verse, because this is the, the, the signature verse of what it means to be born again. And it's the power of God. God is the only qualifier. So we must have him. Nothing else will do. Nothing else will qualify us to be able to understand to be able to enter into the kingdom of God. Nothing else is possible. As we look at this, we want to begin reading at verse uh, 25. I'm going to read it, and I'm going to have you uh, work with me when I read it back again. Now, I want you to listen to this. In verse 25 in this signature passage, uh, passage of what it means to be born again, then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you will be clean. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe them, my ordinances. Now, I'm going to read it again, and when I say I, I am going to literally point to you that you would, when I say I, you say God, after I say I. Okay, you ready? Then I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Did you see the work of grace upon a dead man's soul right here? When God does a work, it shatters with a hammer that stony heart, 
He shatters that stony heart with a hammer of his word. And then that heart, that heart begins to burn for him like a fire. Right? Do you love the Lord? Man, because God first really did love you, and that's why he called you out. To come in and to, uh, like we had in uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, we had the temple cleansing taking place. We have that taking place right here. This is the first person singular pronoun, I. It's mentioned five times. That's all of God walk, working on a dead man's soul. All of God. Not some of God. All of God. All of God because we're all dead. And we need to be raised up from the dead. And that's grace. 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 We see this first part, the sprinkling of the clean water. Now that is speaking of the priest when they would sprinkle something symbolically, right, and, and cleanse the, the vessel with that. And by God's blessing in his word, he would cl cleanse that. It was set aside for God, that, that spiritual, spiritual cleansing that we need has to take place. But listen what it says. I will cleanse you with water, clean water on you. I will sprinkle clean water upon you. It's not talking about baptism. It's not talking about that because it didn't, it would be a work. And if it was so important to be baptized, wouldn't Jesus be baptizing somebody? So it just doesn't pan out there. But think about this. When's the last time you rejoiced that God has forgiven you of everything that you have ever done? He come in and took over your temple, and like we saw the radical work that he did at the physical temple, he takes over this temple, man, he cleans the place out. From head to, from toe, head to toe, he cleanses the place out. Now he has a new heart to give, but don't forget this part here where he says, and I will cleanse you from all your unrighteousness. I will cleanse you from all your sin. Did you get that? You tired of hearing that? May it never be true. Never, may it never be coming out of your mouth, man. I, you know, we've heard that. No, no, no. We need to hear this over and over and over again. God has had mercy upon our soul and cleansed us and made us right with him. In him we owe everything to. Why? Because you did not or I did not get what we deserve. We got grace instead. He's forgiven you of everything. You owe him everything. What did you chase down last week? It says everything about you. What was the most important thing you did last month? It says everything about you. Oh, what you value Salvation, value what Christ has done, value grace that cleansed you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Look, it goes on in verse 26, and I, that being God, will give you a new heart. Isn't that nice? He shatters the stony heart with the hammer of his word. Then it replaces it with a heart of flesh. This actually means something good. The sin that you once loved, you now hate. And the spirit that now dwells in you, the new heart emotionally that you have here in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, behold, all things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new and continue becoming new and deeper all the time. Why? Because God just don't give you a stamp. He changes your life that you may love and run to him. Because Romans 5, 5 is really a reality for a believer. The love of God has given me the ability to love him. Praise God for that. He's given me a heart of flesh. Before I didn't have a, I mean, a heart of uh, 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 flesh, yeah. Before the heart was a stone and didn't have a problem with sin. Didn't have a problem at all. Lest it found them out in some of the places that I go, it's, some of that is true. But sometimes God puts a person in a place that he may have an interview with them, a little conversation, and say to them, maybe this day he's saying it to you. Do I know you? 
Do you know me? Or do you know about me? Praise be to God, he took that heart out. Here's the other qualifying thing that's really important. That verse 27. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. Why? Because of the work that has been done in you by the power of God, he's changed your nature. And that's what has to happen to us. Our nature has to be changed. Everyone is born with a fallen nature, but we have to have the nature, a divine nature, as spoke about in Peter. We have to have this divine nature, and therefore it's going to show up in our lives. It's going to produce fruit. Right? We love Galatians chapter 5, 22, where it says about the fruit of the Spirit. We love those things. But don't forget what it says above that when it's the fruit of the flesh. Right? We put titles in there, but they sure, sure, sure missed that one. Here's the fruit of the flesh, and here's the uh, uh, fruit of the Spirit. They put this one in, but they missed that one. It's an examination. I, I, I'm telling you, it's a cause and effect because God has run us over, raised us from the dead, cleansed the temple out, gave you a new heart, gave you a new nature. He raised you from the dead, and now it has an effect on you. You have new, a new nature, new desires, and new wants. And the reality is because of God, who is rich in mercy, shed his grace upon us. Is that your God? I had a little G God for 40 years. And I said that I believe, but you could tell a tree by its fruit. He's talking to the disciples. You can tell a tree by its fruit. What comes out of your mouth comes from your heart. That should be an oh my. And, that, and we're not talking just cu curse words. What comes out of your mouth and hatefulness and despise and pridefulness and all that says something about you. It speaks volumes to the people that are around about you. And it says, oh, that's what it means to be Christian. You can act like that, and at the end you get to go on to glory. That's not what the Bible teaches us. We need a new nature, and when that nature has been changed, we have new desires. There's a cause and effect. You can't have the cause and not be affected. Because of God spoke this truth to you, if it has no effect, you know not God. So this should trouble us in one way, that it would cause us to run after this God and say, Lord, be merciful to me, the chief of sinners. We know that you doing that is not going to save you just in the act of that. But you do have a responsibility, even though you're dead, to seek God. Back of John, verse 4, chapter, chapter 3. But if anybody had a, a mind of understanding, you would think it would be Nicodemus. And just in verse 3, it says it again, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see, meaning understand the kingdom of God. You can't understand the kingdom of God. You cannot understand what the kingdom of God is. What you will do is build idols until you get what you think is the kingdom of God. That's what you'll do, and that's what man, fallen man, does. He gets, someone gets them to do something and popishly declared them to be saved, and then they're satisfied with that, and now they could go live like the devil. And that is the fruit of the devil, as we see in Ephesians chapter 2. The required qualification is God having mercy upon our soul. Do you believe that? You should because it's plain. It's explicit in the Word of God. And only he, which you saw in that text in Ezekiel, 
Only he was the one that raised you from the dead. Did you raise your hand in that process? I don't think you did. Did you repeat a prayer in that process? I don't think you did. It was a dead man receiving the pneuma, the spirit of God that raised him from the dead, that changed his spirit and changed his nature. And now that is a new creation, a lover of Jesus Christ versus what he was before, a hater of Jesus Christ. You don't like him. You're either all in or you're all out. Can, can you hear those words today? Because this is the most important words that you'll ever hear. And this is the most important text that we'll ever be in. And that's disqualifying anything else. But this is truly the key. You want to open the door? You need the key to open the door. And the key is God himself invading your temple and cleansing it, making it new, raising it from the dead. And Nicodemus responds this way. Now, a blind man cannot see, cannot understand. We're talking spiritually blind here, but a physical mind cannot, a blind man cannot see. A deaf man cannot hear. And so when we see that, they, Nicodemus is looking into to the eyes of God, looking in the face of Jesus, and it's like he's not looking. He's not seeing the God of glory stepping down, tabernacling among us. God come to teach. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Well, you know, it clears it up here in just a minute, but Nicodemus is strictly thinking in the flesh. That's all he's thinking is he responding in the flesh. He's thinking in the flesh. That's all a dead man could do is react in the flesh. That's all he could do. Build these idols constantly. I'm a believer of Jesus Christ. I have nothing to do with the church and you're a liar. And the Bible says that very thing in First John. You don't love God's people because you don't love God. Hard stuff. But so is open heart surgery. <laughs> Your life depends on the surgeon. So we see here that Nicodemus just not getting it. So we see the qualification expounded here. Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of the water and of the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. It'll be better read like this. Truly, truly, I said to you, unless one is born of the water, comma, in the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You can't, we just saw where you can't see, you can't understand. Now we can't even enter unless one is born again. And it's not talking about baptism here. It's the same thing that we looked at in Ezekiel 36 when he says, I will sprinkle clean water on you. The, the high priest, our great high priest is Christ himself. He says, I will sprinkle you with clean water and you will be clean. Not partially. Amen. That's good. Completely clean. I will sprinkle that on you. Same thing we have right here. Unless one is born of the water, sprinkled, made clean by the power of the Spirit of truth. The Holy Spirit of God coming in and cleans, cleansing the place up. And that we, we see that it goes on and, and it goes on. It says, unless one is born of the water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And we see the Spirit, we, we cannot enter without having the Holy Spirit of God dwelling within us. This is so important. We need to uh, memorize these things. I have a man right now that is memorizing the book of John. He's on round number six or something like, praise God for that. Now, it all starts here. John 3. Now, him, you know, Nicodemus had many things memorized. That's not the qualification. It's the heart change now that a man wanting to look into the eyes of God, wanting to, to see God who came to teach each one of us, each one of us, who we are, who he is, and the grace that was done when we sung that song, stricken, smitten, and afflicted. That was grace that he shed his blood for somebody like me and you. You have to have the Spirit of God 
for you have not the kingdom of God. Now, what is the kingdom of God? Well, you can see the fruit of the Spirit is that. But it's even in the hard times of uh, many things, it's the hardest of times that we, we pass through, and we see that the Holy Spirit of truth is the one that, man, he, the Holy Spirit is sovereign. He moves how he wants to, and you can't conjure him up either. You can put all kind of signs out there on the road, say revival tonight. My question is, how do they know? And the revival, again, is for the church. It's not an outreach ministry. It's for the church. We all don't, I don't know, I'm not going to get you to raise your hand, but I would raise my hand. I need a revival today to remind me what God has done in my life and the grace applied by him unto me that keeps me by the power of Christ. And I will see his face one day. And tell them we have the mirror. To, I mean, we have his book that he's given us to look into the eyes of God. If you don't want to read the Bible, feel sure that something's drastically broken. How could you not read a letter from the lover of your soul? It's written here. And see that cannot, we see it in verse 3, cannot. We see it in verse 5, cannot. We see it plainly in scriptures. That, and that's not talking about may not. That's not saying you may not enter. That's saying you do not have the ability to enter into the kingdom of God. And that's what that means. You do not have the ability. What's the key to everything? Well, you didn't have faith before you were brought to life. The key is that God brings you from the dead and everything else falls in place. You, be, you begin to have faith. Your faith wasn't enough to even get you to church while you're in that dead faith. It's a gift from God. We saw that last week. We see it again. Ephesians 2 is clear. We're saved by faith. It's a gift of God. We're saved by grace. It's a gift of God. Isn't that wonderful? Don't get tired of hearing that because that is your banner that you have on you the rest of your life. God saved me from him and through him and to him and to God be the glory over my life forevermore. This is our banner. Why? Because now the Spirit of God changed my spirit, meaning my nature, to follow him. And that's the most precious word, words a dead man could hear. The required qualification is expounded here. It goes on to verse 6. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit, meaning spiritual. We, Ephesians, you go look that up. You have once, you have a kind of spirit in you. But it's really speaking about what is, what is spiritual is not fleshly. What is fleshly is not spiritual. Right? That, that it's just talking about you can't think earthly and think you're going to understand who God is. You can't think spiritually and have any desire for the flesh. That flesh that he now gave us a new heart in that flesh. And man, we hate sin. We're sensitive to it now. He won't let us get away with anything, will he? Even the smallest of matters keep you up all night. Thinking, man, I barked too loud right there. Or my think they don't even know what happened. Now, here I am. Man, I need to repent. Thinking your thought life now bothers you. Because you're not thinking right about other people. And you need to repent, maybe today. But that, see, that's, that's not religion. That's the spirit of truth that now dwells in us. That's God himself teaching you what he does not like and what you cannot do anymore. That's good. You can't conjure that stuff up. It's all of God. Says to Nicodemus, now you think about the, his, Nicodemus' facial expression. 
right? I mean, it's just jaw dropping when you think about all his credentials that he brought to the cross, that he brought to this interview. Interviewing God, when God turns it around, no, Nicodemus, we're going to interview you, and you don't qualify. None of us qualify. God is the qualifier. So where should we, where shall, how shall our hearts pump? How sh- what shall we run after? Is the only qualifier that is available is Christ himself. To be born from above. You know, if you want a new car, you save your money up and you work hard to get it, get the new car. That's, that's a, a zeal revealed. It's not necessarily wrong, but it could be deadly. But how about your zeal for the Lord? When you look at the scale today and you, and you examine that as we prepared to come to the Lord's table, when you examine that, how really is your scale working out? More flesh or more of God? Work in progress. It's a definite, without a doubt. Don't be amazed. Put your name here that you must. There's no other way. No other way for you to be born again. You must. No education is going to get you here, there. No repeating the prayer is going to do it. No baptism is going to do it. No joining the church is going to do it. It's just not going to do it. It's just not there, and you can't do it. Why? Because it's just not spiritual. It has religion, but it doesn't have God. That's the big difference when you must be born again. Now, look at the sovereignty of God in verse 8. He said, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from or where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. I can't believe that we missed that. I can't believe the years uh, or the years, 40 years, some in church, some out, that we missed that. What what am I talking about? A dead man can't do anything. God is sovereign, and he sovereignly is going to raise his children from the dead. You can't control the wind. We know what the wind looks like around here. We're going through that storm. God is so much higher than that. That's why you really should hate to hear, and I mean the word hate, When you hear that stupid stuff on TV, Mother Nature, I'm here to tell you it's Father God. We may not understand it, and we don't understand everything, but it's Father God who is sovereign, Father, uh, uh, Son who is sovereign, Father, I mean, uh, uh, sovereign Holy Spirit who is sovereign. We see it right here. It does, he, he does what he wants to, when he wants to, and how he wants to do it. And your prayer should be right now, Lord, evade me, evade my very soul, crush my heart, crush any religion in me. Show me that I am trusting in someone else or something else besides you. Show me, Lord. That should be our desire. Because the cause and effect is that, well, the effect is you're cut out. But you cut in. You cut out of the world, but you put into the kingdom of God. Everything about you changes. Your desires have all changed. Everything about you, inside out. You can wash the outside, but you can't wash the inside. So we see the, the dead qualifications at the beginning, the required qualification. You must be born again. This is the key to the Christian life. It starts right here. And then we see now the rejected qualification. Because you're either going to receive that uh, uh, qualification today or you're going to leave rejecting the truth that you've heard. You will not leave here neutral today. You can tell a tree by its fruit and he, God knows everything about you. Remember in 23 and 25, he's omniscient. You're not going to tell him something he doesn't know. He already knows. Here we see the rejection. And we see by the power of God that he is rejecting the truth of who God is. He's rejecting what God uh, has laid out for him. And, and we're going to look at that. Nicodemus said in verse 9, 
He said to him, how could these things be? Isn't that, <laughs> that's, that's difficult for us, isn't it? How could these things be? That should be something that we're looking. How can, how can a man be born again when he's 50 to 70 years old? How can a man be born again? Well, if you're thinking on earthly terms, that's the question that he brings. If you think about the spiritual things of God, you, you, you are looking unto him and you understand this. But I'm going to tell you, Nicodemus leaves this part right here unconverted. And like I said, you'll not leave here neutral today. When you turn this off, it'll still be there. You either receive it or you don't. How can these things be? Nicodemus said, man, I've been, I've been a teacher all my life. I've been in church all my life. I've been there. I got the right blood in me. I, I mean, it's, it's all there. It all adds up. How can you tell me I'm not qualified? I would say it's more of a shock, and he may even be broken at this time, but he does not lay it all down. Listen to what he says. In verse 10, Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and you don't understand these things? Here again, very important words. Truly, truly, this is the third in our passage today. Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know. And you testify, and we testify what you have seen. And we testify what we have seen. And you do not accept our testimony. Right there. And it goes on. Right there, listen, I, if I told you earthly things and you don't believe, he's, right now Nicodemus is an unbeliever. What are you? If you're a child of God, man, you got plenty to, uh, uh, to rejoice over. Right? If you're not a child of God, yeah, woe is me. You're right. That's the, that's the place that, to, to be there. Do I really love him? And all these things are, are coming out and, and, and understanding. He's, you don't understand because you're not a believer. You won't even receive these words. Well, you know, Pastor Wesley, it's up to us to accept God. No, we're accepted by him. The scripture says it and it's settled. We should be like Isaiah in chapter 6 where it says, Woe is me, I know nothing. And that's what it should take us if we're clinging to my, our, my whole family's been this or that. And that's our qualification. But he rejects the only qualification. You must be born again. How hard are you searching that out? How hard are you looking for that? He is the teacher of Israel. People came to him to ask him questions. People waited in line to talk to him. And he has God as a teacher right now, and he can't hear him. He can't see him. He can't uh, understand any of that. Why? Because he's dead in his religion. He's dead in that. It means nothing. To those who have been raised from the dead, it means everything. God is the only qualifier. We see these words here uh, where it speaks of I, meaning, uh, verse uh, 11, truly, truly, I say to you, we, who is the we there, we speak of what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not accept our uh, testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Okay, who is the we in there? That is all the way to Genesis 1-1, all the prophets of the Old Testament, and what Christ has already said with John the Baptist and Christ and his ministry now moving forward. we got three years before Nicodemus even comes to Christ. And now, let me tell you this. You don't come a little bit. You don't come a little bit. You don't come a little bit at a time. When you're born again, it is right then. And everything changes. And you grow and continue to grow. But you don't take baby steps, baby steps to Christ. You can't. When he changes us, it's right then. 
It's kind of like his miracles, because, you know, the new birth is a miracle. Nobody had to go to therapy after he healed somebody. Amen. Complete right then. Praise the Lord for that. And the we, and the we to us would be this. Let me hold it up for you. Testimony. Old and new testimony right here in our hands. It's the heaviest thing that you'll pick up all day. Heaviest word that we'll have will be in John 3. Right next to that, God in Isaiah chapter 6 being thrice holy, is that uh, uh, crescendo there? Right underneath that is this text. You must be born again. If I told you earthly things and you don't believe, you're not going to understand heavenly things. You're not going to understand you're dead in sin. You're not going to understand this grace by grace you are saved is not of yourself. You're not going to understand how bad it is. You're going to laugh at sin. You're going to laugh at the TV that you sit and watch and look at a TV as you laugh at sin. That's convicting, amen? We should be a little quicker about turning it off or changing the channel. If we love him, that will increase. Then if I told you, who is the you? All of Israel. All of Israel. He represents Israel as the teacher, all of them, as they have done from Genesis 1-1. All of them. Now listen. Verse 13. No one has ascended into heaven. Stop right there. When you see that stuff, that nonsense on TV, just go ahead and turn it off. No one goes to heaven or to hell and comes back and teach us something. Amen? Just doesn't happen. That is man in his flesh trying to conjure up something spiritual. It's spiritual, all right. It's of the devil himself. It says no one has ascended into heaven as in to come back and tell us something. But God, who came to teach, stepped down out of heaven, stepped off of the throne, took on flesh, tabernacling among us, and now he is God come to teach. He was, he was God come to teach. He is the Son of God who became the Son of Man. Amen? This is the power of God on our life. God, Jesus, is the only qualifier of this salvation that we must have. Come now, let us reason together as we had last week. Come now, let us reason. Let us work these things out. How heavy is this for you today? Well, what am I going to tell my parents? Who cares? No one cares about that. What am I going to tell my, my wife? Or what am I going to tell my husband? You shouldn't even care about that. This Christ means everything. Everything, and it does not matter what people think. They need the truth. They need the truth. Don't be ashamed of it. Don't be ashamed of it. We see the, that Christ, the God came to teach. God came to teach us. Isn't that wonderful? Are we teachable? Did God really come, come to teach, teach me? Yes, he did. And he's still teaching me. And I pray that he's still teaching you. He that began the work will finish it. Amen. I have not arrived. You have not arrived. We have not arrived until we're dead and we have arrived. And it's all done. Now we get to enjoy him forevermore. If you're not enjoying him now, you're not going to enjoy him there. Then. If you got a religion, you're going to hate him there. Well, I've been in church all my life. What are you telling me? Well, you need to hear what Nicodemus heard. Maybe you got it all wrong. Well, maybe you got it all right. Don't forget that part. That's coming. It's the power of God. Now, think about this interview, and we're closing here. Think about this interview. How did you come out? How did you come out in the interview? Are you looking into the face of God through his scripture? 
Do you really want to know this God? When he changes you, he will. But you do have an obligation. Lord, please come invade my life. Lord, please come invade my very soul. Lord, sweep this temple out. Give me a new heart. Show me what it means to believe. Show me what it means to repent. When he gives you a new heart, you'll know what it means to believe. You'll know what it means to repent because that's the beginning of your life as a repenter. You hate sin now, even though it is in your life. You hate sin now, right? Let's not think of the all the outward stuff. I tell you, it's, it's a, a new creation. It's a resurrection. It's a, trans, a transformation of a life. We see that in Romans 12, a, a translation from the darkness into light. It's a new heart. It's a, it's a new nature that we have now. As Peter told, tells us, we have the nature of God dwelling in us now. We love what he loves and hates what he hates. And we got room for improvement in that. But don't let that, re don't let that rest with you because, oh, we have room for improvement. That's good. No, that should bother you. The Holy Spirit of truth is sovereign. And we need this God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your truth. And Lord, we pray as we have gone through this passage today, with so much more, as always, so much more to, to unpack is just the beginning of what a life is in you, a life that has, a, a dead life that has received, a dead soul that has received life. You didn't have to save anybody. You didn't need anything. And Lord, we, we thank you for the truth that you've given us. But help us to, to rest in your truth. Thank you for not giving us what we deserve, but giving us grace. Thank you for bringing uh, uh, us in life. And now we're about spiritual things versus earthly things. Thank you, Lord, for not asking me if I want this new birth. Because my answer would be no, because I was dead in sin. Everything starts right here. Lord, may this ring true in our lives forevermore. We must be born again. And by the sovereign grace of God, Lord, it would be to you to be the glory. We pray these things. Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.